uh, doing this is because our, by the way, Antoine Baker, president of the Institute of Commerce. Um, the chamber was receiving a lot of questions from our business community that were uh, questions that the town should be answering. And so we asked the town if they would be willing to set up a question and answer period, and they were gracious enough to agree to do that, and that's why we're here tonight. So we have our mayor, John Enswin, and our CAO, Bernie Morton, who will be answering questions. We have some of the other uh, uh, members of council here as well. And I'd like to introduce our moderator, is Bruce Anderson. Um, Bruce is managing partner in Be Creative, he is the 2014-15 Chair for the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. After progressive management roles for 20 years, Bruce became an entrepreneur. He serves as Managing Partner for B Creative Group, an outstanding marketing and design and management consulting firm. He actively consults across Canada in business planning and development, strategic direction and alignment, and market concept feasibility. In 2007, he continued his long-time interest in adult education and joined the University of Virginia's Faculty of Business Administration. Later, Bruce was also appointed as Director at the Center for Management Development, located in the faculty. He teaches business strategy, policy, and entrepreneurship. He holds Bachelor of Commerce and MBA degrees, and also holds the designation of Certified Management Consultant and Certified Association Executive. Bruce is a past president of the Regina and District Chamber of Commerce, chair of the Saskatchewan Science Center, chair of Saskatchewan Chamber Science Committee, a board member with the Institute of Certified Management Consultants of Saskatchewan, and is also active as a business coach mentor. So I'd like to say thank you for these three gentlemen for coming here tonight, and uh, let's give more hands. Before we uh, uh, get into the questions, and I've only got 350 of them up here, so um, I think we're scheduled to 12. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's some great questions in here, and, I, and I'll just read them as they were provided. Um, and I'll be passing the mic over to uh, uh, John and to Bernie to let them sort of um, probably tag you know, some of the answers. But I think, John, you want to start with a quick uh, uh, comment and set some context to so I'm the, the chair. I really want to thank you for this opportunity. This is terrific. I don't know too many other communities where we can have a community like this, so I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And um, I think it's important that we have events like this. It's important because fundamentally the business community and the municipality, not to mention all the other stakeholders in the community, we're, we're on the same team. We're trying to build Kinsley, a Kinsley that's sustainable, and a Kinsley that's growing. And we want a Kinsley that's economically and socially vibrant. So, thank you for having us here tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, also just want to take two minutes to just say, uh, outline briefly our strategic plan. And I do mean briefly. And the reason I want to do that is that will help frame uh, some of our answers for you. So fundamentally what Council is after, and this strategic plan expires uh, at the end of the term of this particular council, so next council has the freedom to do what they want to do. Uh, vision is a positively engaged community building an economically and socially vibrant future. I think that's what we're doing this year. Our mission is we want a family-friendly, multicultural community that is safe. We want an approachable, innovative, and fiscally responsible management. And we want to be forward, have a forward-looking approach to recognizing and fostering opportunities, solutions, and wealth creation. So that's part of the conversation tonight and part of our partnership. And then uh, the values are quite extensive and exhaustive. I don't want to go into them right now, otherwise we'll go beyond midnight. But here are five priorities that we want to talk that we're focusing on for our mandate here. One is open communication. This is part of it. Two is we want to be financially transparent. A lot of the questions were about taxes and what we're doing with your tax dollars. So this gives us an opportunity to try and communicate that. We also want feedback. Uh, excuse me. Um, feedback from you. What are the chamber's policy suggestions how we should move forward? Because a lot of the questions, uh, there's a lot of tension in there as to what does the chamber want 
and there's not always clarity there. Uh, we want strategic growth. We want to grow in a smart way. Uh, I remember running and the concern being, have we missed some of the growth opportunities that are in this area? We want reliable infrastructure. We have more than $90 million worth of assets that we have to manage and maintain. Uh, when I selected the infrastructure deficit, uh, was over $40 million, just over $40 million. Uh, now it's around $37.5 million. And finally, organizational effectiveness. We want a town administration, public works, parks, uh, community services, everything, uh, to be as effective and efficient as possible. That's what we're aiming for. So that's just an overview. Thank you, Dean, for having us, and I look forward to uh, responding to the questions. Great, thank you, John. So just from a format point of view, we're, we have a series of questions that have been generated. Uh, there is a whole bunch of questions that were available to be asked, and we don't have time to, to do all those questions. So what we're going to do is I'll ask the question that was presented. Um, I'll invite the, uh, the mayor or the CAO uh, to respond to them, or both, uh, however they wish to do that. And then we'll ask for a clarification. And, and the clarification from if anybody wants to seek a question of clarification, you have to ask you to use the mic. And we're going to strip that opportunity, we're going to strip that opportunity, I'm sorry, to uh, members of the chamber. This is a, a chamber activity, and, and for expediency, uh, that's the way we'll handle it. Um, any questions at the start? So, if that's the case, sorry. Uh, members of the business community, they'll oh, step sorry. up to the mic, state their name, and the business yes. that's Thank you, Mr. And I'll, so, just to clarify again uh, what I should have said, is that the, uh, um, so it, it is members of the business community, and when you go to the mic, just uh, use your name, uh, provide your name, your business, and uh, that'll help us uh, keep track of, of the questions and so forth. So, with that, let's start with the first question. Uh, okay, the taxes are increasing for business property owners, but there are no improvements in services provided. Uh, why are the increases needed? There we go. Um, actually, what happened is uh, a number of questions. There's 49 questions submitted in total, and uh, some of them were very related. So we bundled them together, and they were given to the chamber uh, ahead of time. And so some of the questions that uh, we see here, that's not the one. Uh, anyways, they all revolve around the theme of the increase in the taxes and uh, what are the services that are being delivered. Uh, also, we talked about distribution of the tax load between residential and commercial. Uh, worried about uh, the effect of high taxes on small businesses. Uh, further, um, again, it's just about distribution of the tax load between business community and residential. Uh, what about the effect that Caleb Place has on, has on our uh, revenue? Uh, why, again, at this moment in time, are we increasing taxes? And uh, what's the total amount of money the town of Kennedy spent, spent on uh, uh, consultation, surveys, designs, etc. over the past two years? And then um, uh, what's the annual budget from the census years 2011-2011? Uh, so we'll start over that. And uh, I've got to say, this past year, um, my second year uh, as mayor with budget process was the most difficult one that we've had. Mind it's only been two, um, but we just, you know, it's not that we found it out, we just drilled down and drilled down, and making some of the decisions we did were very, very difficult, I can assure you of that. And uh, what we are going for was something that reflected the realistic needs of the community, as well as some of the, um, responding to some of the pressures. And uh, so basically what we're looking at is, from a capital perspective, we need a new fire hall. So there is, um, we put into capital expenditures, expenditures about 3%, equal more than $600,000. That's the fire hall. We have to relocate the landfill. Um, and then we also contributed money towards the new multi-use facility. And the $112,000 that we allocated for that matched the money that was raised in the previous year. So that's all we've done is we match the money. And we need to make those capital investments. There's no doubt about that. Further, some of the pressures that come on are based just on what the province requires. Uh, the public service accounting board has certain rich, um, requirements that the municipality has to offer, and that includes hiring uh, a new position, specifically regarding asset management, 
It also creates workload in other places, so we're going to speak to that later. The other thing that we've really been hit with that I want to highlight is construction costs are skyrocketing. So I don't know what's happening in your business, but for us, uh, Rutley Crescent, which has been long overdue for uh, deep service work and new pavement, uh, we originally budgeted based on previous years and what we would reasonable expectation, including an increase, out of 1.5 million. You know what, that's, not, that's only coming in at 1.9 million. In the last couple of years, uh, we've been hit hard. I'll give you an example. Has everybody been on the pedestrian bridge going over Motherwell Reservoir? No, it's a beautiful walk. I encourage you to try it. We budgeted hundred thousand dollars for that. The cheapest bid on that came in at four hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars. And that's just what's happening in the construction industry. We were able to get that done for hundred thousand dollars, and we'll speak to that in a later question. But those are some of the pressures. The forecast that we've seen for construction inflation is forty percent over the next two years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bernie to speak a little bit about that. And some of the factors contributing to construction inflation is mean reducing the infrastructure deficit. There are older workers in that labor market, and 25% uh, of them about are retiring in the near future. And then just gravel. I don't know if anybody's gravel in their backyard or anything like that, but gravel is incredibly expensive these days. So, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I can't really see the slides. Next slide. Okay. Which one do I have? Okay. <coughs> So the bundling of this question is question one, two, three, seven, and four. I think it's one of the, that's right. These are all, as the mayor indicated, questions specific to uh, taxes. One of the one of the questions that uh, came about spoke to. Oh, uh, that's great. Thank you. One the questions as part of that bundling of the tax questions spoke to about the equitable distribution. Of, um, of taxes and there being perhaps an unfair shift onto commercial property versus residential property. So that is one of the, one of the questions. Uh, and that is true. Uh, council made a decision that they wanted to shift and one of the tax tools that we have is the ability to shift through um, uh, through uh, property class um, taxation shifting, um, and that is called the mill rate factor. We can use a basic uh, mill rate, and that would be a decision of council to use a basic mill rate, but we provided some examples of what that would actually, uh, what that actually mean. I think it's also important to note that as a town and not as a city, we have only three classes of properties. We have residential, we have commercial, and we have agricultural. So commercial is every commercial. It's industrial, it's a small mom and pop store, it's the large industrial store. Um, and then within residential, it's all one class, whether it's an apartment building, whether it's a condo, whether it's a small you know, 750 square foot bungalow, it's all lumped in together. Uh, the benefits of cities is that they have the ability to subcategorize within those classes. So you can have downtown commercial, you can have highway commercial, you can have industrial, uh, and even within the residential, you can have high-rise residential, you can have, there's all sorts of ability, ability to subcategorize. And that means that if you're going to be doing some of the shifting, there would be more classes upon which you can share your tax burden. Right now, we only have three. So, uh, here we gave some examples of what using the mill rate factor versus using a basic um, tax rate would mean. So we've taken a condominium. This is a condominium that's located in Rosedale. Uh, given that the tax roll is actually closed, I can't give you that specific address, but this is a condo that's located in, in Rosedale. Their 2013 taxes were 3,597. Um, the 2014 taxes uh, were a 4.5% increase, and that was uh, 3,758. If we were to use just one basic tax rate, um, which was which would be the same applicable to every single class, their rate would go up 22.2% based on the budget that was approved by council. Uh, a residential uh, home, so we, we picked one address, 
and we did the same comparison on the basic of just one flat tax rate versus using the mill rate factors, their taxes went up 20%. This is the shifting that we we're talking about, which I think, I'm not sure if this is a formal chamber position or not, but that's maybe something that you may want to consider as part of the 2015 budget uh, consultations, whether or not you wanted to use that. Uh, but we took a property, a downtown commercial uh, building, and we uh, used, again, shifting away from the mill rate factor, just the basic mill rate, and they saw a reduction of 14% in their taxes. And we took a, a building in the industrial area, again, it's all deemed to be one under one class, and they saw a reduction of 11.6%. So the moral of this is that, yes, we can move to one basic tax rate if we wanted to, uh, and that would be a decision that would be made uh, by council. It would be on the basis of, uh, of what the community wanted to do. Uh, I think sitting during, uh, in the budget consultations with council, uh, one of the issues that came up was that commercial properties have the ability to write off their business taxes as a business write-off. Residential do not. And so one of the rationale that was given towards a slight shifting towards commercial was the ability to use that as a, as a tax write-off. Whether or not that's something that the Chamber of Commerce wants to explore as an organization and take a formal position on, um, given that it's a question for tonight, I think that would probably be worthwhile and that um, the Council would likely like to here from your fan. But this is basically a slide. Uh, we've done the same. Um, we just use a bar graph to illustrate the same in terms of what that shifting would look like. Um, that's again on basis of dollars. And the next slide shows the same in, basic, in, in terms of percentages. Um, in terms of the hours, uh, we track all the hours that are that are worked. So we, there was some question in terms of uh, the level of service. Um, whether or not you are getting an increased level of service. So over 2013, um, 2013 versus 2012, we did see an increase in terms of the hours and the level of service. Uh, setting service levels is an important discussion with council. You know, the higher the services, the more services, the more the costs. Uh, and that is really determined by, by the community. The more services you want, and the higher the cost. The level of service is also important as well. I'll give you an example of the rate. We've increased uh, our rate staff because of some of the demands of the users at the rate. Uh, they wanted to see more frequent cleaning. They wanted to see more people uh, uh, doing a variety of different other types of jobs during the high season, and so we added staff onto the rate. And that's basically an increase in terms of the level of service, but there's costs associated with that. And, is that the last? Uh, your worship, did you want to speak to this here in terms of the break? It speaks a little bit towards um, some of the decisions that we made and how stuff is allocated. So this is um, uh, the, how the revenue uh, was allocated. And again, um, this speaks very clearly that we made some uh, decisions about the capital growth here. This is some of the pressure that we put money in for um, reserves and things like that, but also on the other, some of that is, you know, this year, other is about $118,000. That includes the operational expenses. Uh, that includes uh, some maintenance items. It's a broad scope, and uh, that's only $118,000. Now, the other thing, too, that we decided with uh, reserves is payback reserves as well. Uh, what some communities decide to do is that, you know what, instead of raising taxes, we're going to draw down our reserves. Uh, decision of the council so far has been that we're not going to follow that path. With over $90 million of assets, it's not a question of if something's going to break, it's a question of when is something is going to break. And we have to make sure that we have the resources to be able to address that. I'll give an example, the first winter of our term, uh, one break uh, that we had was uh, for a water main was over $550,000. This year we got off lucky, we, you know, it was only about $100,000 for a couple of them. So we got very, very lucky, but we need to maintain those reserves. So if you know, $1.1 million comes out of the reserves, we have to put $1.1 million back in. We have to make sure that we can cover everything and that the town isn't unduly at risk.
information in it because the cost of a stamp can accommodate two pieces of paper and not just one. And even so, even small little things like that in order to improve our level of communication is the things that we're looking at. But we heard from the community. Um, there was uh, some uproar. Members of council said to us that, uh, you know, through coffee shop talk and places where they're venturing, that some individuals had felt that uh, that another communications person should be hired. So we responded to that, and we decided not to hire that particular uh, position. Um, the, uh, the engineering technologist uh, position is a new position that we are hiring, and we are hiring that because that department is extremely busy and it's basically part of our growth. Um, the bylaw enforcement officer, uh, which is being hired, is actually a half-time person. We had one and a half bylaw enforcement officers, um, but we are hiring a full-time bylaw enforcement officer to complement our other full-time, and that position will basically will be paid for in itself by the by the infractions which are going to be written. And those are primarily going to be focusing on evening and weekends, whereas our current bylaw enforcement officer isn't working uh, on evenings and weekends. Now this will be enforcement that will be happening on evening, evenings and weekends, and that's the direction that we've been given by council. A lot of that um, will be focusing on uh, on uh, some of the heavy truck traffic that we're experiencing on the on uh, on 12th or sorry on 11th and 12th, um, so those are the senior staff. Um, uh, in terms of uh, additional complement of of uh, staff, uh, we've hired four total of four new people um, since my arrival here, and I would say that the volume of, and outputs in terms of what we are facing and what we are challenging in terms of our growth. Uh, certainly you can't go anywhere around town without, without seeing that. Um, so is there another part of that question? I think perhaps open it up to the floor for Any clarification? Again, I'd ask you to uh, state your name and your business, please. Thank you, uh, Rod Perkins, Post Perkins, and other charity accountants. Uh, one question I submitted, and uh, I didn't bring it with me because I thought it would show up here, obviously, I've overruled. I, in looking at your audited financial statements, there's one classification called administrative salaries. It's in the general administrative section of the financial statement. Basically, it covers the people in your office. 2009, and I don't hold me to the exact thousands of dollars here for this question that we printed, but uh, 2009, the, the salary figure was $406,000. In 2013, it was 806 those are audited financial statements. I've gotten their public information. I would like to know why that that is a huge increase for 100% increase for a community that doesn't grow on more than 200 people. Um, so in that particular category, there's a number of variety of different things that, that go in that. It's not just salaries. Um, there's things such as our, our uh, workforce, um, unionized workforce did not have benefits. Now our unionized workforce does have benefits. Um, the, we had some uh, retirements, and we had to pay out vacation staff and a whole variety of things related to that. We have adjusted the, um, the salaries. The average salary in the town of Kindersley uh, was $36,000 two years ago. The average salary now is $40,000. That's what they make. That is not a lot of money to be living in this, in this community. That is the facts, and that is the average. And when broken down between 52 staff, um, the, um, you know, we, 
we know that we're just simply not competitive. We have a difficult time retaining people. Uh, we have a difficult time recruiting people. Um, we're going through the process right now of recruiting, of trying to recruit a new director for community services. And what they're asking for is $26,000 more than what we had offered. And that is simply the going, that's simply the going rate. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge in a market that is heavily driven by oil. Um, labor challenges are everywhere. And we are an employer as well, and we're a business as well. And we operate like a business. And we have, we have challenges retaining and recruiting people. So we have done some minor amendments in terms of the salary scales. But for the most part, some of our positions we are, for instance, with the mayor has just received uh, some comparables from the community of Humboldt, which is a, a comparative community uh, for us. And uh, I would say in about 50% of the categories we are under. And for others, maybe 5% of the categories, we may be just slightly over what they seem to be paying. And then the rest, we, we seem to be comparable. But we're still about 50% of those categories uh, under. $40,000 is the average salary in the county. Can so I can't really explain it much more than that. Thank you. Uh, just one clarification for. Uh, next question is, why is the Town Council pushing ahead on projects that are wanted and not in need? The uh, example is the swimming pool is a, greater, is a larger draw for the community which results in more spending in the business community. We would like the Town to concentrate on this need before the wanted uh, spray park. We'd like to take this one. Thanks. It's an important question to be answered. Uh, we're partners in developing Kinder's Lane. And uh, part of the partnership is what's the quality of life that is here. People move to community for more, and they stay in community for more than just a job. They, they stay for other things. What's the quality of life? What are the investments that I can make in my children, or in myself, or in my parents? And these are some of the questions that we're addressing. And the spray park is just a part of that. That's one of those little things that makes Kinsley desirable to others. You know, we have a subdivision development going on. We want to turn the people who live in this hotel and live in the other hotels on a part-time basis into full-time residents here. And the way we do that is by having a quality of life that makes Kendersley a place that they want to move to. That's part of the rationale for the spray park. Part of the rationale too is just recreation. You know, people come, uh, come I'm sorry, I mean, um, a destination that if people stop in Kindersley for coffee or whatever, they want to take the kids someplace, they can do that here. So there's a number of factors, economic development, quality of life is part of it. If you want to attract and retain employees, you need to live in a good community. i give you an example, North Battleford, since they've developed the Qplex. Whereas before, in the health district, their uh, application list or resumes were about that thick. I've got my hand up about half an inch thick. Now it's about two and a half, three inches thick just because the perceived quality of life has changed that much. That's what we need to do for Kinder's Lane. And this is why we're going ahead with the spray park, and this is why the multi-use phase two is so important. We kind of live in a big empty here in West Central Saskatchewan where if we want to do something in the wintertime with our kids, or if we want to have our own theater and things like that here, or if we want to work with the college to have a culinary school here, or we want decent banquet facilities. KI has great banquet facilities, Tom, don't get me wrong. Uh, but we need something that also isn't just the rink either. This is all about quality of life. That's why those decisions were made, and that's why we're going to continue, or at least I'm going to be supporting some of those things. We need a quality of life. That's what it boils down to. Oh, sorry, one other thing. Sorry, Bruce. There's also a lot of people asking for a spray park as well. So, um, yeah. Question of clarification. Yeah, the clarification's on the question of which one. Is it a spray park related? No. Okay. Uh, Could I ask you? You may, you may get another uh, question later on that might fit your clarification. But I don't want that. I am representing 
the college. So a uh, type community. And I wonder who is going to uh, use that park uh, thinking about immigrants. We have about a thousand immigrants who came to this town uh, who are earning ten dollars per hour. Do you think that they will be able to go and use all that? They use those parks and the other stuff. If they are not making income, they have no housing, no other things. And we are thinking about having a beautiful park, which will be open like for eight months, will be winter, and for the next four months, you you have to you will have lots of mosquitoes around. You cannot use it anyway. So your question is: Is can it be supported? Help those any grants to use that? Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You raise a good point, um, Liliana. Um, it'd be nice in a, in a perfect world to be obsessive compulsive and do one thing after the other. Uh, we don't really have that luxury as a town. We have to try and facilitate a bunch of different activities at the same time. So we're working on housing while we're working on quality of life issues. And um, a spray park is something that will be easily accessible. Uh, you know, the families can just go there and when they want to use it, the kids just slap a button and it'll activate and then after a period of time, uh, it'll be deactivated so there won't be excessive use of the water. But uh, yeah, so we're doing all these things at the same time, housing, infrastructure, and uh, quality of life things. And it's a big jumble going on. I know you only said one question, but I don't think you should really ask. But I don't uh, have young person um, can see that. Yeah. And the spray park, uh, it's not that I feel that the member, the people of Kindersley are against the spray park. It's a great idea, but maybe not right now and not where you've planned to put it in, in beautiful Baker Park. Being a recreational thing, should it not go with the pool in the recreation area instead of having children, cars, everything parked in the Main Street area as you come into Kindersley? If I was a stranger coming into Kindersley, I don't think I'd want to see a spray park first. You know, like, Baby Park is beautiful, and if money is tight, why would you not tighten your belt, put the spray park down the road, a year or two, we've waited this long, what's another couple of years? That's 183,000, 188,000, I'm not quite sure what you quoted, 100,000 donated, you still have to come up with $88,000 for the spray park. And you're saying that money's tight. If money's tight and your furnace goes, do you buy a furnace or do you get a new car? Same kind of thing. Like, it's not that Kinder Sleep people are against the spray park. We all love things for our children to be worth, I guess, grandchildren, if I'm so lucky. But that's my question. Why now? When the pool's gone down, it should be at the recreation facility, not on Main Street. Thanks. Um, that was one of the things that we pondered. Do we include it part of uh, the new phase two? And uh, one of the things that was identified is that Baker Park is really one of those locations that's underutilized. It's really not used enough. So is McGowan, so is Westbury, so is lots of other places. That's Main Street. Yeah, I guess, you know, uh, it's just one of those parks that's underutilized. The parking's going to be revamped as part of the design over there. It's actually moving over to the east, sorry, the west side of the library. Uh, so there are changes to try and compensate for some of those things. As you said, tourists may be a little bit different. Uh, however, um, we still have to go ahead. And we have to demonstrate quality of, of life. That's what this, you know, sort of, we may have to disagree on some of these things. Um, but that's kind of the decision that was made, and especially given the donations that were given towards that. 100,000 is uh, one, and there may be other donations as well that we're talking with the uh, groups of people about. Okay, next question. Um, why is the town of Kindersley spending business tax dollars on a healthcare study? Isn't this a provincial jurisdiction? I really wish I didn't have to deal with the health issue. This has been one big hit. Um, why are we doing that? You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. You know, they've been doing a lot of the same things and we're not getting anywhere different with it. So what this council has decided is that we're gonna do something different. We're gonna step outside the box 
and we're going to be a part of the solution. The Physicians Group came to us with a request for more than $400,000 per year in operational subsidy. For us, that's unsustainable. It's just not an option. So this, the Kinsley Health Services Needs Assessment is designed to be able to find what are some of the problem areas here and what are some potential solutions. You know, some of the questions too have been, how many people, how many physicians do we need? You know, and people will compare to Meadow Lake or Nipawin or some other community. What we want is evidence-based solutions. We don't want hearsay. What council wants to hear, okay, what are the facts? And let's make decisions based on the facts. So that's the purpose there. The other reason that we end up getting dragged into healthcare is because um, it's not working. I'll give you an example. There's three different approaches to how we can try and facilitate healthcare. Nippling is, uh, is an example I'm going to use. The council there invested $300,000 to develop a new facility for the physicians. They had an agreement in principle with the physicians. The money was spent, the building was starting to be built, and the physicians withdrew. So the town and then the private partner that they're working with, working with sorry, are left with a building and land and $300,000 that's not going anywhere. Right now, the town's uh, investment in healthcare is we are one of nine owners of the clinic building. We just own the shell and the frame, that's it. The physician group owns the rest of it, their for profit model. Another model that you can go to is Rosetown, just down the highway. The town of Rosetown has decided to invest in a clinic. They own and operate it. The clerks work for the town. The physicians pay a lease, and that's about it. But, you know, the furnishings, everything like that is shared between uh, Rosetown and some of the NRMs. Every, almost every mayor, actually, I'm trying to think, I'm going to say almost, almost every mayor that I've spoken with about health has been dragged into health care one way or the other. And municipalities have. And the way the system is currently set up, it's cannibalistic because it pits one community after another. And I'll give you an example. Nippowin raises their rates. We get a request from our physicians here that we should be doing this extra. That is unsustainable. It is not working. So, you know, we can continue playing that game, but this council has decided we're not going to play the game. We're going to try and find some solutions. So we've allocated up to $45,000 for this healthcare needs assessment. Because we want a solution, because what's currently going on is not working. And then the other thing that we're also doing, because it is not a municipal mandate, but almost all of us are dragged into it one way or the other, as we're trying to get together so that we can actually do a grassroots approach to the Ministry of Health. Instead of everything being top down with the Ministry of Health, we're going to see if we can try something from the bottom up. So that's why we're involved. Am I happy we're involved? No, I'm not. I'd rather wish that we weren't. I wish that we weren't given a $400,000 annual request. But you know, those are the facts. And that's why we're trying to deal with it. Hi, I'm Vicki Newmeyer and I'm part owner of Mr. Southern Kinders Lake and we have some development property as well. Uh, my question about health care is, is a big concern because I think once you enter into the arena, you take on problems for health care. And you said, Mayor Anselm, that once you're in the arena, you're in it. So by taking $45,000, there's no guarantee or is there a guarantee that anyone's going to hear your study or do anything about it. There's no obligation by any of the parties, in my understanding, that you'll even have a, a hearing with the people who could actually make changes. So I guess I'm a little worried. So next, is it a, a group that isn't traditionally even funded or part of the town of Kinnersley, but we bring you our problems, and you take it on, and you take a study on for too much money, with a bureaucratic system and a lot of players that are very difficult to manage, as you've mentioned. So when does it stop? Like, I believe we have enough problems in our own community to deal with. Budgets, numbers, people, wage increases, all of those things. Why would we take on something that is impossible, impossible to change from a member of council? That's what I'm asking. Thanks, Vicki, I appreciate that. Um, frankly, at that time, we were afraid we were going to lose three or four doctors this summer. That's one of the motivating factors. Whether or not they were left, I don't know. But I agree with you. It's a worry. Um, how do we get this made? Having said that, um, back, I think it was May, I'm not sure, 
I happen to be down in Regina on another matter, and uh, I was able to get in to see the minister. Making process. I have some compelling reasons for doing so. We do have one employee in the town who has restrictions. He's basically uh, has a monitor on his, he doesn't have a monitor on his ankle, but that's very much what like He's under house arrest. That's a water treatment plant manager. He is not allowed to be, uh, I believe it's more than three hours, uh, one way away from the town. Is it three or two? Three hours. So Kevin, our water plant manager, he cannot go to, to Hummel. Hummel will be as far as he can travel, or maybe uh, the other side of Drum Heller. That's as far as he can travel, and that's legislated by the province and, and agreed to by the federal government because we need quality health water. If there's a breakdown in the plant, Kevin has to be able to respond to ensure that we have safe drinking water. But those same conditions don't apply on administration. This is the Supreme Court ruling. Really. It's a human rights issue. Um, you know, we just be wasting our money to fight something like this. My name is Barry Andrew. Uh, I'm part owner of Kinder's Insurance, and I would challenge that. I understand what you're saying, John, but I know for a fact there's probably very few, or maybe no, oil field companies in this community. Don't have a residency policy and they all enforce it fairly strictly. I know that for certain. If you don't believe that residency policies can be enforced, then maybe you need to talk to Pamela Wallen and Michael Duffy to find out about that. I think that it's reasonable for a community to expect that their key administrative staff has skin in the game and they're investing in the community. Earlier, you just said that the reason you're going to build a spray park is you want people to live in a good community and we need these services, but yet you don't expect your own staff that are making some of these key financial decisions to live here. Now you're right, maybe if that was challenged at a Supreme Court level, you might lose that case. But there's nothing wrong with having it in the contract because I'll tell you what a lot of people do. Thanks, Barry. Um, no, we've spoken about it before and I appreciate it. And uh, my preference would be along what you're saying. However, why pick a fight you're going to lose? And the same thing with the oil patch companies. You know, if one of their workers decide to challenge it, I don't expect the company to win. They may win because they have more money to back up their legal muscle. Yes, Maybe the more appropriate question is why did I decide to live is that really the question, Barry? You know, Bernie, the answer it's, that it's not a personal issue. It's to me, it's a pragmatic issue. You, you know, I think that you've got to have skin in the game. If if you're if you're making decisions like, for example, a tax increase, it should affect you. It should affect your family. It should affect your children. I think you need to be invested in this community, just like the rest of us are. You need to be a tax-paying citizen. Mayor Mike Hank, which had to resign some five or six years ago because he bought an acreage but yet he still runs a business in the community. The Municipalities Act didn't allow him to maintain being a mayor. And I'm not the only guy saying this, Bernie. It's, we want to see people that are making some of these big decisions being invested in the community. It's, it's, uh, it's as simple as that. Well, first of all, as it relates to taxation, I am not a decision maker. Council is supreme. Council are the ones that make the decision, it's not me. My job is to implement the operational plans that council wants me to implement. I am an implementer. I am not a decision maker as it relates to taxation. So that's an important part. Um, I did try to find a home in Kindersley. I have a large family. And I couldn't find a home in Kindersley. I looked. And I looked for a long time. And I secured the services of a real estate agent to help with that search. Um, my salary is basically didn't permit me to be able to find an appropriate home. But I bought my car here, and I buy my groceries here. And my insurance is bought here at Kindersley Insurance. I am a member of this community in many, many ways. And I don't think that anyone could ever question my commitment and my dedication to the community. And saying that perhaps I don't have skin in the game, I do, because I take my job extremely seriously. This is a career, 
and it's an important job. And I came from Toronto to be here in Kindersley and help this community. So I do have skin in the game there. So it may not be personal, but I just want you to know that if you feel that I don't have enough skin in the game, I'm happy to meet with you and you can tell me about how, what additional skin you'd like to see from my end and what additional levels of participation you would want to see from me. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is, with two communication officers, we should have clear communication as to where uh, business tax dollars are being spent. There is confusion as to what is paid for with grants and what is paid for by tax dollars, and we'd like some clarification, please. Thanks, Excuse me. Um, I think as Bernie said earlier, we have one communications officer. The consensus around the council table is that we like the level of service. However, um, with a lot of the miscommunication that goes on, I can't help but wonder that we should have more communication officers because, uh, as I said, is the response of the some miscommunication or misunderstandings. Regarding the uh, inventory of grants, um, Bernie is going to address that. Uh, one of the mandates, it's a policy mandate by the council to administration, is that they look for um, grants. Can you go to the next slide there? Um, Thank you. Um, it is a pretty onerous exercise to be trying to scour uh, community organizations, uh, provincial grants, um, and they're never the same. We have some we have some stable grant funding that comes in through the through the revenue sharing that comes with the uh, gas tax, and that's federal. But uh, we spend quite a bit of time scouring for these grants, and even if there's grants that are not applicable for the municipality to apply for, and they're more community type grants, we facilitate uh, community organizations applying for those. So here's just a few examples of some of those. Um, the uh, KSIP grant, some communities actually take that KSIP grant, $45,000 this year, and they put it entirely towards the operating. We actually distribute that KSIP grant uh, through our uh, REC advisory committee, and there's a committee that, that meets, and through the applications from different community organizations, we allocate those funds. Um, there's the Canada Summer, Summer Jobs Program, you can see the number there. The Student Summer Works Program, which helps to uh, fund some of the uh, student labor. We have the, uh, so the dog park was funded through the Eco Connections, and that's uh, through CN. Uh, flood mitigation, that's province. Um, and the, uh, and the list goes on. Um, the, um, some of those are federal, some of those are provincial, some of those are organizational, some of those are departments within, um, within certain, uh, for instance, SAS culture uh, divisions within uh, other levels of government. But there's a pretty comprehensive list, and these are important parts of our, of our revenue stream, uh, and they're always changing. So we always have to be in the, at the front end of figuring out which grants uh, are available and grant writing is not simply you submit your application and get it. You have to actually write an application for the grant and state why you believe that you should be eligible for that. It's all it's a competitive process. Uh, I think that is it. Clarification. I just want to add that when we apply for those grants, when the staff applies for those grants, they cannot be used for other purposes. So, to give an example, the dog park, uh, I think it's $25,000. Uh, that cannot be reallocated somewhere else. That can only be used for that particular project. It cannot be transferred for us to give them back. In terms of communication, would this be beneficial to have on the website at all times when grants are, are available? Or if people are concerned and worried, that's proactive to have this on as, as well as the financial statements and all those kind of reports that are valuable. Um, that, that's really helpful. Council reports, all those things are helpful. Your minutes are great, but it doesn't expand. It doesn't tell us the real story that you're telling. So maybe that's just one way to communicate. Thanks, Vicki. We'll endeavor to do that. Monica's taking notes of uh, the great suggestions that we get tonight. Thank you. Next question, the business community would like the town of Kinnersley to utilize more local businesses for their projects. The business community car carries the brunt of the tax dollars paid to the community, and local business make huge donations back to the community, as well as providing local employment. 
they should be given preference for local projects. Thanks. I'm going to turn this over to Barney shortly, but just the long and the short of it is, is that Saskatchewan belongs to what's called the New West Partnership Trade Agreement. We have to follow um, uh, procurement and uh, purchasing uh, guidelines, and, uh, and uh, those are fairly strict. So they have to be opened up. And what we want for the community is the best value for the dollar, and uh, that's the level of service and the dollar value. Uh, now we have uh, even an example of a project that. Um, where we save a lot of money, but it's tied into this. Is that's going back to the bridge uh, at Motherwell Dam. Uh, the engineer company told us that the bridge should be able to be placed for $100,000, so that's what we budgeted for. Now, the cheapest tender on that was $477,000, a gap of $377,000. Uh, our staff were able to find someone local who does a lot of work in Kindersley to do it for $100,000. So that's an example of it working. If there's more Bernie's detail with you, can I cover? Uh, sure. Um, there are probably many businesses here in this room that uh, have been the recipient of town of Kindersley business. So we do use a lot of town of uh, Kindersley business uh, locally. Um, and thank you to each one of those businesses who have helped us to uh, the work that, that we need to do. And I know that on many cases a lot of it is last minute. You know, things break down at the last minute and we need someone on the fly to come in and help us and so thank you for that. In terms of uh, those that require us to go out and do a competitive bid process, um, that again is legislated, it's part of a legal process, the tendering process is a, is a legal process. We have our purchasing policy and our procurement policies and then we're also bound by uh, by the new West Partnership uh, Trade Agreement. Um, and uh, in many cases, what that results in is getting the best possible price and the best possible service. And that's being efficient with your money. I just want to ask the Chamber if this is something that, you know, that the Chamber feels strongly about, about my local for everything, uh, make that a resolution or bring it forward. Oh, that's great. Um, I just like to expand on that. It says for local businesses for their projects. Well, it's also purchases. There's many things that the town of Kindersley can purchase in Kindersley that they have not been doing, whether like from uh, lawnmowers, vacuums, uh, insurance. All of the local businesses should be given the same tender as given out of town. Because apples can only be compared to apples. Um, we do that. We do. We get competitive bids for things that aren't required to go through a full tendering process. We get competitive bids, and we usually get them locally. How many people here in this room have done business with the town of Kinnison? Yeah. So there's there's lots. So we do. We do no, no. That. I'm saying same tenders for each business. If you're giving, say you're buying a vacuum from my store, which after 15 years you finally did, um, you don't give the same tender paper to each thing. Like if you're doing a vacuum, it has to be the exact same vacuum that you get a price from me as you get from Saskatoon or wherever. And like I can give you examples, but I don't want to bring up crap. So I'm just saying that the town has not done that. And there's a lot of things that you can purchase in this town. I myself paid eleven thousand dollars in taxes in June. My business should get an opportunity to do vacuums in all sure. of the town places. If there's a specific example that you'd like to speak to me about afterwards for sure. Uh, or even come and meet with me. I'm, I'm happy to discuss any particulars. I'm just not saying you have projects, to follow. it's purchases as well. Like sure. projects, yes. Yeah. And I was at a town meeting where we had the signs down outside of Kennedy. This is before your time. There was no tender put up for them. And we went to the meeting specifically for that. And I was told by our mayor, which is not you, sorry, not uh, that she had told somebody that knew what they were. I knew that person had phoned local businesses to do it. Like, are we not smart enough to pick up the phone and contract things? 
purchase things, sell things. I want kinder sleep within reason. I mean, if I was gouging you and charging you $2,000 for back and then everywhere else is being 1000 then by all means, that's only fair. But there should be a bylaw in kinder sleep where within reason, whether you're going to go 15%, it should be purchased to Again, we have the purchasing policy and procurement policies. That's a policy that's set by council. If the chamber has any recommendations, if you can review those, and if you have any recommendations in terms of how to make them better, I'm happy to bring those by way of uh, a recommended report to council. I'll be there. Thanks. Thank you. The next question. The business community is worried that developers are turning to other communities because of the lack of information at the front line of the town council. Will the town of Kindersley please take steps to resolve this? We would like uh, for developers to have available to them whatever information they need in a timely manner to prevent them from going elsewhere. This is one of the mayor's promised priorities in this election platform. I guess, Mayor, that means you. Thanks. Um, yeah, there have been some changes. I believe there's been improvements to get packages. Now, Wayne is going to go through our new website here shortly. Uh, not a live demonstration, we're already almost a quarter after seven. Uh, but a lot of the information, frequently asked questions, and the packages that people are asking for are available online. Or you know, if you go to the front desk of the town, they're available there. Yeah, standardizing the way that we do things has been a big priority um, since my arrival, and making things simpler. Uh, plain language. Um, we now have packages when interested builders and interested developers are coming to the counter and wanting to how to build something, whatever. We have a we have a standard package now, and we're always looking towards improving that. We submit that to council for them to review. Um, and if anyone has any questions in terms of how to improve that, so that is the paper package. And then we've also through our improvements to the website have made all those forms available online. Um, and under one uh, section within uh, within the uh, within the website. If anyone would like to see live how that works, we're happy to do that. If not, we can move on to the next question. Okay. Right. Since not, we'll move to the next question. Uh, why does the town not provide garbage pickup for businesses? Um, actually, I'm going to turn this over to Bernie, but I want to ask the chamber. Uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, do a survey of your business to see if this is a service that they want. It'd be an increase in the level of service, and it'll probably have a cost to it, but I'll turn it over to Bernie now. But I was curious the Chamber, for a lot of these things where people express an opinion, pull together something and come meet with us. Um, I invited to Londa, uh last year before she moved. Let's meet on a regular basis, and let's keep the channels of communication open. Talanda's move, so that's made it difficult. Uh, Jason's not here tonight, but I've mentioned it to Jason and, uh, and Sean through back channels. You know, if there's someone from the board, uh, from the chamber board who wants to meet with me as a designated designated representative of the chamber, I'm willing to meet with you on a regular basis. Or if you want me to come to the chamber board meeting on a on a regular basis, invite me. I'll come. Okay. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, this speaks to. To I guess level of service. Some communities have commercial garbage pickup, other communities don't. Uh, there's a cost for that, and um, it just all depends on whether or not that cost you would like to uh, you would like to share. There's two primary reasons why those communities that don't have commercial garbage pickup have decided not to have it. The first is restrictions on garbage. As a municipality, we have restrictions in terms of the types of garbage that can go uh, into a bin, the uh, volume of garbage, and also the frequency of pickup. Uh, in other, in many communities where they don't have commercial garbage pickup, they don't like any of those types of restrictions. They want to be able to have their own standardized garbage pickup with their own private supplier. The second is that uh, through the bundling of uh, commercial garbage pickup, many communities and even chambers of commerce are getting together and they're speaking to It's holding our town back from becoming a city as well as preventing employers from hiring much needed additional employees. Local businesses create substantial jobs and therefore local growth. However, 
We uh, cannot do this with the, without the availability of affordable housing in Kindersley for new residents. Um, yes. So what's happening this week? Uh, all the grading has been done over uh, for Colorado Estates. There's been, if I just preempt the question of Bruce, there's been no change in the contract with Brooklyn or anything like that. Um, the grading's done, the trenching's been done, uh, the deep service crews are moving in this week if they're not already there. I didn't go out there today, today to see if they were there. Um, so that's, been, that's starting at the end of this week or the beginning of the next week. Housing starts when we actually get a nail into the wood. Uh, that depends on the developer. Uh, we have approved uh, a condominium development. Uh, don't know when they plan on starting that. That's in the Brook Hollow Estates as well. Uh, on a conceptual basis, uh, not a formal application, uh, we received um, to look at, just on a concept basis, uh, a series of uh, apartments on what would be called Jackson Court. And that would be on the south side of what's going to be Brook Hollow Boulevard. But again, uh, when will nail hit wood? I can't say. But work is getting ongoing. They are a little behind due to the weather. Uh, I remember I was over there one day and looking at They had waves in the trench. It speaks to how much wind there was and how much water was in the trench. Okay, next question. The business community is hoping that town will diversify from the old oil sector and prepare for an eventual economic slowdown. We'd like to have substantial long-term jobs in Kinnersley to create long-term population growth to justify city status, what steps are the city of, uh, is the city of Kinsley, the town of Kinsley, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, um, taking to achieve this? Thanks, Bruce. Um, economic development. Um, it scares me to think, you know, 30, 40 years down the road, what's going to happen because there's just so much unknown. All the economists that I've spoken with that are retired and are familiar with what's going on here, business leaders, uh, they're confident in the uh, medium term uh, for what's happening here in Kinders and looking 10 years and out. Uh, what we're doing, in our, we look at our role as how we facilitate growth, how do we facilitate uh, economic development. Uh, a chamber request uh, from a few, more than two years ago, and it's reflected in policies which were written in 2010, I think, was for business liaison, business liaison officer. Uh, so that is a position that is currently filled in the town working towards that. Uh, what's been done to ensure that there is expansion is that, you know, uh, for solid infrastructure, including the water line, uh, the water tower, improvements in our infrastructure, we're working on those things. We're looking at housing, we've got a subdivision that's going now, and we're looking at quality of life issues, and some of them enforced on us by the pool. So these are things that we're doing, but we also know and believe that this should be a partnership between the town and the chamber, as it is in many other municipalities across the province and Western Canada. And it takes more than one group organization to do effective organization, um, economic development. And so we want to work with you on that. We want an effective partner. When I first joined the chamber, uh, I checked off the box that I wanted to be a part of the chamber that looks after economic development. So I want to throw it back on the chamber's lap. We need partners here. And we want to work with you on that. Um, during the uh, first six months or so of our term as council, we uh, put an ad in the paper and in the public, in the community, that we would like to start an um, economic development committee. My hope is that we can take such a committee and form it into an economic development corporation where what we can do then is be an incubator for startups. We had one person submit their name for the economic development committee. And we know the business environment here is very busy. It's tough for people to make time out of their days, uh, especially in long days here in Kindersley, uh, to do things like that. So we've tried things, we've put it out there. If we want to do it again, that's fine. If the chamber says, you know, we have some people who want to do it, we're all ears. Because fundamentally, we do have to diversify the economy. Uh, we have been talking with a, a group, I'm not going to go into details, but they're not part of the oil patch. And uh, we would hope that they would move here, but there's also a number of communities moving there. A part of economic growth is retention of businesses as well. So we want to have a business-friendly environment. And this dialogue tonight helps us be a little bit more sensitive to some of the concerns that you're having tonight as well. Sorry. By creating and fostering an environment where 
businesses are want to are going to want to locate in Kansas City as a top a top priority. Um, the, you'll recall that uh, four years ago there were 13 percent tax increase and 14 percent tax increase respectively. Uh, two years ago it was rate of inflation because if you're not raising taxes by rate of inflation it's costing you money. The commitment that I made to council when they put that challenge to me we have. 13% and 14%, how are we going to manage this? I mean, this is not sustainable, and I agree. And my commitment to council was to work on developing plans, and that we would limit the, rate, the tax increases to rate of inflation, because rate of inflation, again, if you're not raising them by rate of inflation, it's costing you money. And that would give us time to be able to work on and developing plans. We now have the Kinders and Growth Plan, we'll show that uh, slide a little bit later, which is a combination of 11 different and in speaking with new businesses, which is a good part of my job, uh, that wanting that are wanting to locate uh, here in Kindersley, we have you know, Iron Horse is uh, is one, Kalmina is another one. There's small businesses and larger businesses. What we speak about is we speak about planning and investments in infrastructure, and they believe that that is an important component to them making a decision to locate in Kindersley. And so, as we are growing, we always need to be thinking of and fostering. Uh, quality of life, improvements in terms of quality of life, that's our facilities and that's the programs that we offer, um, the, and the commitments of the volunteers to help with many of these programs that are not just town run, but they're also, we have a fantastic core group of volunteers in this community. Uh, amazing. And that speaks to the fabric of the quality of life. And the other is having plans and implementing those plans. So they're not just plans that are sitting on the shelf, but they're part of speaking about how we're going to be uh, we were fortunate to make the front cover of SAS Business Magazine, which spoke about that. We were fortunate to make uh, SAS Culture Magazine, which spoke about that. We were fortunate to make SUMA, the SUMA Urban Voice Magazine, which spoke about that. There's many other communities that are speaking about a lot of things that are going on in this community and how we're managing and managing that growth because many other communities are not doing so well and they're asking us, how are you doing that? So I think that this speaks to an always continual strive towards improving the way we do business, fostering a good environment for growth, and um, making sure that if there's ways in which we can do things better, let's not turn the blind eye to that. And that's part of the reason why having this dialogue tonight is important. Thank you. Would you like to uh, ask a, just to yeah. re-identify yourself again, if you would, please? Rod Perkins. I'm going back to Canada. Ask the questions on 10, but uh, maybe this time you can look I think that the biggest problem we have in this community, without a doubt, is housing. And all I see, you know, given that something is going to happen, I appreciate that, but I see nine lots for sale on the Realtors website at 95,000 plus. That's it. So what we're going to end up with is nine $500,000 houses which, in my mind, is not affordable housing. I was quite excited when I saw that they were talking townhouse projects. I have a couple of kids who live in Edmonton, which I would think the construction prices in Edmonton would be certainly land would be higher, for one thing. And uh, these townhouses are fine units, and they're $325,000, gradually. I think that's what we need here. And we've been through developers ad nauseum here. And nobody's building anything. When are we going to see something going up? And secondly, you know, don't be scared to let local developers, if they have an interest. I see a problem whereby it always seems to be concerned that somebody might make a buck. Well, what are we here for? I mean, most people try to make a buck. Those of you that collect paychecks for the town trying to make a buck. So don't discriminate against people who want to build and expand this community. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Housing is a significant issue, and uh, we're working on it. Um, 95,000, you know. That's a tough pill to swallow. It's a lot of money. 
but what's happening is the developer is paying for the, but it's the developer who is putting in the water, the sewage, it's the developer who's putting in the paper. Um, so developed a lot, just like Bernie said, and that part of the is still working in the different communities and in the cities. It goes like you said, and I hope that's here too. But, and not under this administration, but in the past two administrations, we've been waiting for more lots. The process is, is more. I've got letters in my file saying it's the worst place to do business in Western Canada. It's, it's not working. There's things that have to improve there. And it's not just in just this administration. We need some, some changes. And the lot price is 90 grand. That's probably the correct number if you have pavement, with sidewalks, and other features. But we're going to have developments in other, other areas that won't have that. They'll still get the housing. So maybe we can bring it back from sidewalk, go to this paved streets, and do something different. But the, uh, the process of getting, getting things done through the top has not improved. It's got worse over the years. We need to change something. Now, is that some, something we could suggest a private to meeting or something, or would you like to respond to that? Uh, I'm happy to meet with Stu at any time always to try and figure out ways in which we can do better. The information that I'm getting back, you may have a file, but the information that I'm getting back from the developers that are doing business with us is that it's been a fantastic experience with the exception of one. And the one is for the breach of contract. And uh, that's litigation that's underway with the town. And it's unfortunate.